me. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, um, for your amazing work that you've been sharing over these two days and for, for being here. Um, I have two goals for, for my 12 minutes here today. I want to first just introduce this project, uh, the brand new Intra American Slave Trade Database. And then I briefly want to turn to the problem of seeing individuals in this shipping data that we derive the slave trade database from. Um, of course, it's shipping data that treated people as commodities and, and left them anonymous. Um, so I want to talk about that problem a little bit as well. Uh, first, though, um, just introducing the database. Um, the, this new intra-American slave trade database focuses on voyages that dispersed African captives from one port in the Americas to another. Um, primarily at this point looking at survivors of the Middle Passage who then quickly moved on to other places after a brief landing in one of the major American ports of the Atlantic slave trade. Um, the, it's a, a database that in many ways I've been working on for, for about 15 years, um, starting with my dissertation research and keeping track of such voyages. For the last couple years, I've been working very closely with Alex Baruki from UC Irvine, who's my co-PI on the NEH grant that's funded taking this sort of data off of laptops and making it into a public resource uh, that's, that's accessible to all of you. Um, the Freedom on the Move folks think their database is new, but ours has been online now for, I believe, 10 days. We've, we've hit double digits in days. We launched last week. Um, so, um, so I mentioned Alex, but I also want to stress that there are many other contributors to this, and I don't have time to name them all, but I'll mention a few, um, especially because some of them are in the room. So Jorge Felipe, who's somewhere around here, grad student here at Michigan State, um, who uh, contributed tons of information on voyages to Cuba. Daniel Dominguez uh, from Rice University, who contributed information on Coastwise Journeys in Brazil and is going to be involved in the project going forward. Also some key contributors who aren't in the room, Jose Belmonte, Yel Nervos. Um, and then I also want to quickly acknowledge particularly David Altis and Paula Chance for uh, helping us accommodate this new data set in the existing slaveboyages.org website because I think it will be much more useful to people to have it there side by side with the transatlantic slave trade database. Um, and it's very much meant to be a companion to the transatlantic slave trade database. Um, so where that database focuses exclusively on voyages that cross the Atlantic with enslaved people on board, our project picks up where theirs left off. Um, and it's absolutely modeled on the transatlantic slave trade database as well. It keeps track of the same variables um, to make the data as, as interchangeable as possible. Um, it's meant to complement the transatlantic database, but not overlap it. So we do not include in the intra-American database voyages from Africa that disembarked some captives at one American port and then moved on to a second or a third, um, delivering people to other sites. Um, those voyages and their continued movements within the Americas are included in the transatlantic database. So we omit those, we only look at voyages that embark their captives in the Americas and then uh, moved on. Um, so what we have so far in this first version that went online, um, this is what it, what it looks like when you first log into the database. So this is just a listing of all of the voyages in the database. Um, this first version has 11,521 voyages. Um, they document the movements of nearly half a million people. Um, and I want to stress that the coverage is the Americas, plural, not just you know, North America or, or the United States. Um, there are voyages as far north as Newfoundland. Um, so these are this is just a listing of some Canadian voyages. Um, and there are voyages as far south as the Rio de la Plata. Um, these, this is a donut chart of where voyages are coming from that are delivering people into the Rio de la Plata region. Um, another thing I want to emphasize about the project is that like the rest of the newly revamped uh, Voyages website, it's trilingual. Um, 
So you can access the material in Portuguese, in Spanish, or in English. Um, we do not have French yet. I apologize. Désolé. Um, so another thing, so I can't tell you what this says, but I know it says stuff about the database in Portuguese. Um, <laughs> um, and it's all translated. It's not just Google Translate. We actually have you know, native speakers um, do the translation. Now, the coverage at this point, is, as this chart shows, is mainly 18th century and early 19th century. Um, the lack of earlier voyages, um, not that there aren't any, but, but the fewer number reflects really two things. Um, one is that there's just fewer surviving port records for us to work with from the 17th century and earlier. Um, so that's a skewing of the data, but it also does reflect to some degree the reality on the ground, um, because I think the nature of this intra-American slave trade is that as colonial uh, settlement spread in the Americas over time, the institution of slavery spread too, the scale of the transatlantic slave trade increased, and that meant more complicated networks of dispersal after the Atlantic crossing, um, so these voyages out from the major hubs of arrival from Africa. The lack of later 19th century information definitely does not reflect historical reality. That is much more a reflection of who the contributors have been. We, we've sort of started with um, about two thirds of the, the d voyages that are in there are from a database that I compiled from my own research for my first book. Um, and that was focused on the period up to 1807, 1808. So um, we definitely want to expand on that going forward. Um, so to date, the focus has really been on African-born individuals and their further forced migrations after the Middle Passage, these survivors of the Middle Passage who moved onward rather than American-born individuals. Um, I mean, much more can be done and should and hopefully will be done on the 19th century domestic slave trades, uh, especially in Brazil and the United States. Um, and we have some plans to expand in those areas. Daniel Dominguez is already working on an IPEA database for Brazil that's really interesting because it, it tracks overland movements of people in a way that actually suits the voyage-based format in some ways. Uh, people registered these caravans of enslaved people being forced to march inland with the police at checkpoints at the beginning and ending of voyages. They're sort of ahead of a journey who maps onto our captain field. We have dates of departure, dates of arrival. We can sort of construct it like a voyage. So that data is gonna be really interesting and there's a lot of it. Uh, so it'll be a big project. We're also um, in conversations with a historian named Jenny Williams, who's a graduate student at Johns Hopkins, who's currently working on the domestic slave trade in the United States in the antebellum period, specifically focusing on the maritime portion of that. So voyages out of the Chesapeake that are sailing or steaming around into the Gulf states. Um, and that data is, is particularly interesting because in most of the records she's looking at for that, individuals are named. Um, so we'll be able to incorporate her information hopefully into two data sets, into the voyage-based structure, but also into the people of the Atlantic slave trade database potentially um, as that project gets going. And so that makes a moment to transition to the problem of individuals. As, as excited as I am about the launch of this resource and its potential to facilitate innovative research, I also think it's really important to acknowledge its chief limitation. Um, and that's simply that it does very little to, um, to help us see individual people, individual people's stories and their traumas. We don't see individuals well in this kind of information. We've documented voyages carrying an estimated half a million people and yet we can name almost none of them. And that is a very discomforting fact. Um, it also makes for a tricky connection to you know, the, the Matrix Enslaved project that focuses on named individuals um, in, the, in the language of the project. Even in rare cases where we have narratives uh, from slave trade survivors, they rarely contain enough information to create a record of a voyage um, because they often don't mention ships. So here we have you know, Equiano's account of describing arrival in Barbados and then very quickly being put on another ship that takes him up to Virginia. We have a reference to an intercolonial voyage 
but we don't have any specifics of date, of ship name, of captain. There's nothing that we can really use to create an entry. Um, there's nothing to tie it to a particular voyage. And this is a particularly informative uh, individual narrative. More typical is Abdul Rahman's. That's all he tells us. And it's a powerful account um, for a sense of powerlessness and anger at the, at, at the disembodied they, the use of the passive voice to convey this, this vague notion of who it is that's moving him around. Um, but it doesn't offer much to connect with these sort of shipping records we use in other ways. The records that we draw upon to document voyages treat enslaved women and men, girls and boys as commodities for trade. They tally them in ledgers alongside barrels of sugar and tobacco. Um, and as a result, we can often only glean a number of captives aboard, aboard vessels, but not say much else about these people. Um, I remain committed to the value of aggregating that data, however crude and impersonal it may be, because I think it allows us to see patterns with, with which we can answer very human questions. Um, we now know how common intra-American journeys were for survivors of the Atlantic crossing, and I think that matters. Uh, it tells us about individual experience and explains the slave trade to many regions of the Americas that previously we didn't really have a sense of how people got there. But shipping data alone can't answer all questions. Um, and in fact, one of the things that I think is important to think about with this kind of data is that in many cases the quantitative data, at least in my mind, is almost better for generating questions than it is for answering them. And then we need other kinds of sources to answer some of those questions. So I think we need many approaches. We need data-driven approaches. We also need approaches centered on individuals. We need material culture <coughs> approaches. And I think all of these can be enriched by one another. We need a lot of tools in our toolkit. Um, so I am, am running out of time here. Um, so I won't mention a couple ways in which try to connect these with individual voyages. But I do just want to end by saying I think this is one of the, the things that holds promise um, with some of these new projects, like People of the Atlantic Slave Trade, and more generally this enslaved project um, of, of the Matrix team that's focused on individuals. If we can find ways to connect these different sorts of database, voyage-based and individual-based, it will do more to humanize the data um, on the shipping networks. So thank you. Thank you, Greg. Any questions? So I take it you're not going to try to deal at all with the Oberlin trade, but what about riverborne trade? Do you want to that at all, or will you? Um, we, would, we would love to, and we're interested in doing the overland trade too. I mean, for Brazil, we're definitely planning to do that where we have those kind of records that fit the voyage-based model. So the, those voyages I was talking about that Daniel Dominguez is working on, where they they register at checkpoints. Um, I don't know of comparable records for the antebellum traffic in the US, but if, if other people do, we would be more than interested in trying to figure out ways to incorporate that, the overland trade. For the riverine, it's the same kind of, of um, issue where those there are port records that document the comings and goings of ship and people on board. We would love to, to capture those. Um, all of that's within our purview. And, and for me, this is pushing me out of the time period that I've researched on. So I'm really going to be interested to connect with people. In fact, I should get my, my concluding acknowledgement slide on it. It's also got, oops, back one. Oh, well, I went, I shot right past it. Um, it's got my email on it. So I was going to say, please reach out to me if you have ideas along those lines of records we might mine. And I, I think Ben had a question first. I'm sorry. Which you can work with offline, 
we have a variable in the intra-American database that gives a the voyage ID number in the transatlantic slave trade database for voyages where we're able to connect that the people on one ship came from another to help force these connections on you know African origins where that that vessel uh, acquired captives on the African coast. So we're really interested in these ways to connect up the different stages of the journey and kind of complete, even if not stories of individuals, stories of groups of people as they move through the, the traffic. Last question. Yes, um, so just like in the transatlantic database where there are several fields to capture owners, um, we have the same, the same fields in, in this uh, data set. So where we know the name of an owner of the voyage, um, they're, they're named in the database. And that sometimes is individual, but also in many cases it's, it's corporate. So like a South Sea company is a major owner on a lot of voyages. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Martin and, and David. David was speaking first? Yeah. David will be speaking first. Yes, oh, they're here no. on the computer. How do you advance it? Jeff. Can try, it, try it now. Check, check, check. Check, check. Uh, okay. Uh, so I want to repeat what I just said, except briefly to say that uh, uh, Mom and I were co PIs on the first project. <coughs> the funding came in in 2006, and miraculously, we actually got the site up by 2008. Uh, it began, like you probably know, the CD ROM database. And the movement to the web took just two years. The latest iterations, which is just on that 10 days ago, actually took far longer. Uh, and I think possibly it was because Martin was working somewhere else at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the reason, uh, I think part of it, too, was the complexity of the site. We've added features which didn't exist then. And in a sense, what I'm doing is uh, writing here on the backs of other people because what you just said this afternoon is basically uh, an extension um, of what we've got up here. Uh, as this implies, this site is very much drawing on the work of hundreds of people. Um, 
And I'm talking here of contributors as well as actual individuals in the project. So <coughs> quite a few of them were graduate students at the time when we put up the first site and have continued to be associated with the site. And I hope uh, indeed depends on them down the road because clearly uh, at some point a read will retire. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the um, the the project actually was put out as a soft launch, partly because of the complexity. We weren't sure it was going to work. We did it without fanfare. Um, it seems to have taken reasonably well. And I think you've heard already, in a sense, I'm cheating because this is the third session or the third presentation <laughs> on the same topic, i.e. the new transatlantic, uh, the, the new Slave Voyages database. But the new features, you can see uh, Inter-American database, which uh, you just heard about, and uh, of course the recode, and the beginnings of a new project, which uh, will take off from the uh, African Names project. Could we just move on a bit? So uh, this is the raw material. And the question is, uh, what do we do next with it? And as uh, Rebecca already explained, we intend to expand this. And indeed, uh, the central feature for this particular uh, table will be the addition of an identified um, ethnolinguistic term, something to which Phil Savage referred to this morning. Uh, but beyond that, we're also going to be including uh, people who are associated with voyages who were not enslaved. And for this, we uh, have already extracted 40,000 separate individuals from the uh, transatlantic slave trade database, and we will, in addition to that, I think in the near future, be doing the same thing with uh, the owners and captains in the Inter-American database. So we'll probably end up with about uh, 35 to 40,000 people. And that, in effect, is just the beginning because through crowdsourcing, we expect to add substantially to that number. And as Rebecca pointed out, this will include uh, clearly not just the owners and captains, but anyone um, initially that could be associated with a particular voyage, whether it is between one American and another, or transatlantic. So in order to do that, uh, we have taken out the existing 30,000 names, extracted them from the transatlantic voyages database, and we've put them into, sorted them into ports of departure. And we have, uh, with the aid of Bellum funding, established teams of people around the Atlantic world. Uh, that sounds a little grander than it actually is. Four people in Brazil, <laughs> two people in the Netherlands. Uh, but the platform we're using, I regret to say, is a derivation of the spreadsheet, but it's a bit more besides. It's actually a group of sheets uh, with a number of macros written into it, which facilitate uh, editing. So the first step is, in fact, to merge the names of individuals uh, to make sure that we have uh, one person instead of three different identifications of one person. 
The red uh, font that you see is basically the, the additions that have taken place since the uh, project started. And what we're doing is tracking the, the biographical information of each of these people. And if you notice uh, right here, is the total number of slaves, the total number of enslaved people, that each of these individuals uh, carried off from Africa. Uh, so we've got a very clear link with the original database. And finally, uh, my section. Um, here is uh, some preliminary results. If you look at the uh, uh, this is the largest slave trader in British history. Uh, respond to this family, yeah. actually, it's not a single individual starting in the late 17th century. This individual is responsible, or this family is responsible for 136,000 enslaved people leaving Africa. And what we've got is the top 10 in the British case, uh, nine of which are from Liverpool. And then quickly on to the next one. We've done the same for French. And uh, this you can see in terms of numbers of embarked. Uh, it's a smaller scale, uh, but it's obviously very large. Uh, but the interesting thing is really the, the very long tail. In other words, uh, everyone looks for the large slave trader, but the really significant part for me is the extent of ownership of individual voyages. Uh, and this would certainly apply to the inter-American traffic as well as the transatlantic traffic. And that, what that tells you is that basically slavery is totally accepted everywhere. Uh, a feature which I think is insufficiently recognized today. It, it was my great honor and pleasure to uh, serve as the co-PI with David on the original project. Um, and I, in which capacity, I spent a lot of time on the organizational and technical aspects of it. Um, I've since moved on to a couple of other institutions. I'll, I would be remiss if I didn't give you at least one slide on my current institution, although I have some more comments on follow-on on the uh, Voyages site. Um, I'm now at University of North Carolina at Greensboro where we've had a whole series of uh, research projects in the history of American slavery, going back 30 years, actually, to uh, the work that was begun by Dr. Lawrence Swinninger um, on uh, slavery petitions um, across the 15 original states in which slavery transpired in the United States. Um, we've done other work um, listed on this slide, and I can give you more details later if you're interested. We also did work on digitizing that the slave ads that uh, Freddie Parker published. Also, most recently, we just got a award from the National Archives to do uh, digitization of slave deeds, and we're looking to work with Guilford College on records from the Underground Railroad. Let me just leave you with a couple of comments in my last minute or two here. Um, as we, you know, many of us, both in the room and uh, many other people who are not in the room, uh, worked on the uh, Voyages series of projects over the years and have continued to think about these issues. Um, you know, the metaphor that I've invoked here is that the work is much like that of a group assembling a gigantic jigsaw puzzle uh, with our shared goal being to reassemble the histories of enslaved people from these fragmentary and scattered records. Well, some of the challenges are obviously we don't have all the pieces. Uh, the pieces that we have were not designed to work together, in fact, and neither were we, or our institutions or our databases. And there's lots of challenges in pulling together the idiosyncratic practices, methodologies, and fo foci of uh, interest that we all have in our institutions. So the one thing uh, that some of us from the original Voyages site did, we got so interested in this process of research team formation that we ultimately founded a, a nonprofit uh, called the Educopia Institute that really focuses on this work of assembling and cultivating research communities. And with funding from the Mellon Foundation and a lot of work on 
some 17 different um, new research communities that Educopia has founded in that in the intervening 10 years, we've really studied this issue. So the one thing I'll leave you with is, as we're embarking on next stages of trying to link, uh, make more linkages between different slavery research databases, it may behoove us to take advantage of some of the best practices that are emerging in identifying how to best orchestrate and bring together uh, research communities. There are a number of success factors that can be identified in this work and that could be brought to bear. Thank you. Thank you both. Any questions? I think we're going to have to uh, cl close this one down, but I thank both of our speakers very much. <laughs> uh, my, our, our next two speakers, uh, Bruce and Brent. Close it. Less feedback will be better. Yeah. How are we doing? Good? I have to tell you that it's, uh, I'm intimidated to speak after David and Martin. Um, they have made such a remarkable contribution, as well as many of their colleagues who are here today. And it's an honor to be here. Um, I want to begin by sharing a story that really connects to these references <coughs> that people keep bringing about people. It's been one very encouraging thing with, with, uh, this whole initiative with Enslaved.org. 
So we run a conference at Family Search every year called Roots Tech, okay? And it was actually held last week. This year it was held last week, and actually Dean and Daryl were in attendance. Some of you may have heard about it. A few may, may, maybe have attended that. But about, um, uh, about two years ago, one of the keynote speakers at Roots Tech was a gentleman by the name of Melvin Collier. And he told, he's a well-known uh, African-American focused genealogist and researcher. And he told a lot of stories about his work with paper documents and records and successes there and, and, and some marvelous stories. And then he told about his DNA kit. He went ahead and submitted his DNA kit. I'm putting a plug in here for Ancestry. <laughs> it was an Ancestry DNA kit. And he, um, he sent it out, came back, and he was 95% African. And he was thrilled about that. And, uh, and then he, uh, they had this thing called cousin matches. And if, you, if you're not familiar with that, cousin matches are very accurate. You know, the, the piece about your ethnic, ethnicity estimate is it's good, it's pretty helpful, but your cousin matches is really accurate. So he came back with the name Nana Faba Adun. He came up in this list one day. And he, uh, he's this, could this be an African? And it turned out it was an 81-year-old woman from, um, uh, from uh, Ghana, from uh, Elmina, you get that right? She's a woman of, 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 of uh, Fermi, is that right? People of, of, of Fanti, Fanti. I'm not getting that right. Sorry about that. But he contacted her. Her granddaughter had submitted a DNA, and uh, he had a marvelous read. He and his brother went back to Ghana um, several um, months later and had this reunion with her family, which was his family. And I don't know about you. I've only heard of a handful of these ever happening as a, a cousin match. And he commented that this was the most extraordinary event in his life. And he said he'd never dreamed in his entire life that he had a chance to meet a living cousin in Africa. And this is a fellow who has the bug. He's a genealogist, right? And you know how the, the 1870 brick wall, and you just talked about how do we make this bridge happen? And there's a lot of ways to go here, but fasten your seatbelts. There'll be more and more of these things happening. And I make this comment because this, this connecting and discovering of your family, your ancestors, learning about them is one of the things that is, is one of the drivers at Family Search. It's one of the things that is, is really our purpose, is allowing those connections that we believe strengthen people, they strengthen families, and they strengthen communities and nations. So it's, it's a big deal to us. So anyway, that's a, a little bit about um, starting out. Let me just um, cover um, a couple of things. A little about Family Search. Um, a little bit about that. Uh, this last couple of days, and a little bit about records that we have of, of enslaved peoples, and then lastly, some research tools you might be interested in. So, just quickly, um, Family Search is um, established in 1894, um, a long time ago. It's, this is the room it began in. It was known as the Genealogical Society of Utah, and a couple things along the timeline. Um, microfilm began in 1830, 1938, a big technology in that day. Um, 1965, we needed a place to store that uh, microfilm, and so there was a, a facility dug out of a mountain called the Granite Mountain Records Vault. And to this day, it's a, it's a very current, state-of-the-art facility for storing uh, records and documents. In 1985, we built a new library that to this day is the largest family history library in the world. It's in Salt Lake City. 1999, uh, we actually went online and put, began to put our billions of records uh, and make them available free on the internet. Um, incidentally, we also, because we're so global, we have a lot of our users who are either in need of an app-based solution, uh, many of them, and, and some of these that Seth's been involved with, we have a Family Search Lite, which is for areas where bandwidth is really a, 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 it's a difficult challenge situation. So that's something that's there. Um, a little bit of a, uh, just data points. Um, we have 19 petabytes, uh, roughly, on our system. That's roughly the equivalent of uh, 70 libraries of Congress. Um, so it's, there's a lot of data. That's, it's been 125 years, right? And, uh, but we have a lot of work to do there. The, um, just a couple of facts. Searchable records, we have about 6.9 billion. These are, we're big believers in making them searchable, having them be transcribed. And these are actually transcribed individuals. Our family, global family tree, 1.2 billion names. Uh, 480,000 is the number of visitors we have on our website per day, um, unique visitors. Um, we have a full text collection, uh, full text books. It's about 400,000. Um, we have about 300,000 volunteers, not all at once, but, but folks have been volunteered to register to do transcription work. Um, it's about 300,000. And we have 5,140 centers. And those are from our library to a very small, we actually have one here um, in town that's a small center. Some of our collections, you can't see them unless you're in one of our buildings. 
So that's where if you have a collection you can't see online, that's an option. So um, that's a little bit about that. Just a, a, a note, um, we are, um, our, um, the organization that funds Family Church is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And Roots Tech last week, there was an announcement made with the International African American Museum, which is to be open in a couple of years in Charleston, that there was a donation of a couple million dollars, two million dollars that was made. It was a celebration and actually Martin Luther King III I was in attendance. It was a really amazing evening um, to hear him speak, and there were some other speakers. Uh, Mark, uh, Michael Moore here in the center spoke as well. With that, I'm going to have Brent um, maybe take just a second and talk about a few of the records we have of enslaved peoples. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, today, Family Search has uh, a little over 9 million records that are available that are indexed, is searchable. Um, these include slave schedules of the 1850 census, the Civil War service records um, of Union colored troops. We also have the Freedmen uh, collections, which are really exciting, and uh, they're actually quite large in terms of uh, available records that are indexed. And the Freedmen's uh, Bureau, we recently did a project in 2016, and in one year's time, it was 365 days, we were able to bring together 25,550 volunteers. These records cover um, just immediately uh, after slavery, 1865 through 1872. <coughs> this contributes 1.8 million records that are indexed and uh, attributed and available, um, available to you. And uh, Family Search is free of charge, so you can access these, and these are being used quite well uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout, the, throughout the world, honestly. Um, this was an incredible project. This speaks to that volunteer piece that you've heard a little bit about. Um, we have this, uh, this grand plan that uh, we will make available additional records beyond those records. Um, 25 million is, is kind of uh, an aim or a target we have within the United States. And this would be newly indexed collection, collections. Some of the collections we have are actually collections that are indexed and available, but they've missed something like uh, race or ethnicity. Um, we do have some records that are harder to index than we use the public to index. And so those will be collections that we do that are um, commercially, uh, commercially key. And um, then we have some partner collections that we're looking at uh, working with them to present those. If I was to look at this in a, in a graphical way, this might show how that growth goes. Um, so you can see volumes, uh, there's the 9.6 million. Those are additional searchable records that Family Search currently has access to, and those additional partner um, content pieces. It's really amazing when we have over 25 million records that are available and searchable. Um, for the enslaved people. Thank you. So taking that thought one step further, we've had conversations with um, enslaved.org and, and several of you in the room about and what if there was an opportunity to take the excitement of the Freedmen's Project, which was really amazing, what if we could do something that was maybe 10x that size, as, as, as the we I'm talking about is the community. And there's actually uh, Dr. Hall here, Gwen is in the room, as well as Kathy Hambrick, I believe is here and uh, has been involved with a little pilot to, that, that we learning about how to work with local communities. We really haven't done as much of that as a volunteer base. What if the collection could be your collection in your part of the world? Um, and then what if instead of having a, a project focused for genealogists or researchers, it was more for anyone who has a family, who's got a grandpa, you know, someone who's wondering about enslaved records that touches the whole, whole nation and then eventually take that internationally. Um, we've actually tossed around some names even, so we keep referring to it as Freedmen's 2.0. Maybe we've we got to have a name, so we've actually, this kind of keeps surfacing to the top, and we've done some surveys, and, and we've been reminded that even the, so we didn't realize that, the, the, the acronym behind this is it's kind of exciting, but referring it to as ROAR. Um, so just looking to the future, um, some of you have mentioned this, we have about, um, it's, it's international, the Caribbean and Brazil, we have today church records about uh, 16 million church records, they're, they're primarily image only, but they are church records of about 350 plus dioceses in Brazil, and those are currently available online if there's, some of you have done research there. So more to come there, and more we might do with the International African American Museum. But just real quick, research tools. Um, so three examples, this is the Freedmen's Bank. If you were to go search, now this is indexed, right? You see on the left the index, on the right is the image. This is a woman named, named Dice Edwards. And it's interesting because there's several facts. This woman would have had 40 years in slavery. She's emancipated, and in 1871, she goes to the bank to open an account, the Freedman, Freedman's Bank. And it's noted here, it says, brothers and sisters don't know. It reminds me of some of the things that you talk about. Maybe her siblings were sold off, or the, the family was divided up. Where did you live? All over the state. 
But it's interesting, the, the person there, the, the, the uh, bank person noted the remarks at the bottom, strong and sensible. And after that kind of a life, it's remarkable that that would still have that strength. So that's an example of one of, of searchable collections. Example of browsable. <coughs> this is a book of slave births recorded in Middlesex County, New Jersey. We talked about the slavery was all over the nation. Um, so these are eight individuals at their birth. Um, this is about Diana. And this gets a little deeper. Um, oh, I don't have the speaker notes you can read there. But it's an interesting description about Diana's birth. She was born of a slave woman <coughs> and some other things uh, that were there. Um, last example is actually, uh, we said uh, we had 400,000 books. So um, this example is a book we search for slave. If you go into our book collection, they're fully OCR'd. And about two thirds of these are currently publicly available licenses. <laughs> so you can print them out or, or access them and, and, and so forth. This one is a, a keyword search within the book for the word escape. And if you look at this here in the middle paragraph, he says, we all had three days holiday at Christmas. And I therefore fixed upon that time as most appropriate for my escape. And I'm, I'm uh, can we correct, correct term, um, to make myself uh, self-liberated, was that the term we talked about? Yeah. Um, anyway, that's an example of, um, of books. And there's another thing we have called the research wiki, which is very powerful. Another day we can talk about that. Just in conclusion, this concept of people of historic slave trade. I'm um, going back to Melvin Collier, this opportunity to connect people together and ultimately with events and place is really what we're all about here. And it's very exciting for us and we so appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you Greg. I will take one or two questions and then I have some good news. We're going to take a break after that and there's coffee available, but before we get to coffee, let's have two questions. One right here, I don't know your name, but go ahead. Um, Hillary Green, University of Alabama. I use your databases a lot. I teach them a lot. Is when you're expanding, especially with Roar, can you make it searchable by not by people's names, but by their location? And especially the Freedmen's Bureau offices, because so, of the schools and the like, because my students give up. I have to get them. Once you have a name and identify, that's like the second or third, and then it's easy. But it's that first capability. They want to look at all the enslaved people from Tuscaloosa. Thanks for asking ask that question. And we went the same thing. If you ever did a Freedman's batch, you would log in and it would hand you a batch that was random across the country. In fact, um, a woman in a uh, Tony Carrier at uh, in uh, with a uh, created a website called Mapping the Freedman's Bureau because we didn't have one. So our plan with Roar is to make it map based. So all collections we've got a map. So you could go there as a volunteer and say, well, my family is from Atlanta. I see projects there. Maybe this is my family. So anyway, I don't know if you add anything with that. Uh, what is the Mormon Church doing to make amends for its own racist history? Okay, that's a great question. Towards uh, people of African descent, right. in particular. Yeah, um, that's a, a you know a question of concern with with many, um, and um, I, I guess the one thing that that I'm encouraged personally um, and um, about is. Uh, that we're, we're doing some significant things in, in this space. Um, we've been doing for many years, this isn't new. Um, we've been collecting records for a very long time. So, uh, you know, for, for folks that have that kind of concern, uh, we're, we believe we're doing what we can, but there's some things that are, you know, out of my control and so forth. Um, we did make a major announcement in May, uh, where the NAACP came and made a joint announcement with our organization, with the, with the church, uh, about a joint agreement. Um, and we've never done that before. There's never been that I'm aware of an agreement with a third party organization, with the president of their organization, or the president of the LDS Church of any kind. Um, so it's a, it's a significant time, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did it to do what? It was an agreement to, uh, it was an agreement to jointly work toward, as a nation and as a world, <coughs> toward, toward more racial um, um, peace and confidence and uh, that kind of a thing. It was that kind of agreement. So it was just a, a, a kind of a letter agreement to work together. But this is the NACP that, uh, that came to us and worked together with them. So I think there's some exciting things happening. Um, but that's a, that's a fair question that you would ask. I'm happy to chat with you with you more about that. Do you want to add any of that? No, that's good. So, we thank take you. one more question. All right, well, I thank you both. And I thank, thank all of our panelists. <laughs> Coffee for 10 minutes, 10 minute coffee break, enjoy. Okay, I want to announce that we are having cookies today. Cookies. Uh,